Hello again, and welcome back to Illegally Sighted. This is Jesse here, and uh, we are continuing our journey through 2020. Uh, we're doing things a little bit differently. We got our little Yule log burning in our virtual fireplace here, and we are just chilling and uh, trying to get rid of this year that has been 2020, because boy, it's been something. So this time we are going to talk about the actual games of 2020. We've talked about some good, some bad, some ugly, some events, some stuff, some product launches, all that kind of a thing. Now we're going to get into, this is not a, like a top ordered game of the year list or anything. These are just some highlights of things that I either played that I was interested in that were noteworthy in some way to me and the channel and whatever that I think you guys might be interested in. So that's what we are going to talk about in today's video. So we're going to start with some accessible games, uh, some more accessible content before we get into more of the general stuff. Um, the Veil. That demo has been coming out everywhere. It's come to Xbox. An updated version has come to PC uh, a couple times. I think we got a regular demo and then we got a, it's actually on Steam now. <clears throat> so this is kind of a first person RPG. I tried it, I showed it to you, I believe late last year. Riley got to try it earlier this year. Um, I took a look at it on the Xbox because just seeing the console version is pretty cool. Got an audio game on the Xbox platform, so that's pretty cool. I'm hoping that that game, uh, I'm sure everything got messed up with COVID again. Like I said, all the games that we're looking forward to, especially that we'll talk about next video, um, you know, so many things got delayed or messed up just due to the year that has been 2020, but The Veil, definitely looking forward to seeing what that is going to be because I like the story so far and I'm curious to see what they do with it. Pitch Black. A Dusklight Tale, and various spin-offs. So we, we had the Kickstarter earlier this year of Pitch Black, and I backed it, and they've released some audio demos. They released that one playable audio demo where you're kind of in the city area. They released a couple of other demos. Some of them I didn't even play because I know enough about the technology now. I know enough about sort of their engine that I like what they're doing with audio, but I really don't want to spoil these little demo sessions of the game. I just want to hear what the game is like when it comes out. We had the little spin-off game, A Detective's Demise. I covered that about a month ago on the channel as well. Um, a little short. I think that's going to be like an episodic thing, because it didn't seem like that was really ended. <clears throat> so... They're doing a lot of different things with that. What I, I mean, what I will say is I really like their audio design. I think they do a fantastic job with that stuff. I'm a little more concerned about the actual gameplay. Like, is it just going to be like wandering around, you know, listening for sounds, uh, maybe doing some avoiding things sometimes, or like meet this person, collect this thing. You know, what, what is the depth and variety of gameplay going to be? I mean, you know, they kind of marketed this thing as a AAA audio game, which it could be. And the production values are great, like I said. But, you know, we've played a lot of other audio games where, you know, it's kind of been, you know, whether it's been a Blind Legend or just, I mean, any number of games that have been kind of a first person or exploratory game some have been pretty good and some have been really basic and I, again you know audio games they some are really cool but they don't necessarily hold my attention they don't necessarily have a whole lot of replayability and depth and variety to their games so i mean i definitely hope for the best and i i, I wish them well and i do definitely want to see what the full pitch black game is going to be when it comes out because there's some great potential there um 
you know, and again, being a small team, you have to balance, okay, yes, we want to add all these features. Yes, we want to add the variety. We want to add, uh, because, a lot, you know, again, a lot of people you see on AppleViz, you see on audiogames.net, and a lot of these people are a lot more rude about it than I am, which people really need to knock it the hell off. Um, you know, like, oh, these are just baby games. These are just casual, boring games. We don't need more of this crap. You know, every time somebody releases, like, a card game or something that's pretty simple, there's room for that out there. I mean, how many dozens and zillions of games out there for the sighted people, whether it's on PC or mobile or whatever, that are these simple games? But you can have both. You know, just because you don't like those kind of games, don't deny that from other people. You know, but, I mean, saying it nicer, yes, I would like to see more games, be them audio only, because, you know, just like people listen to podcasts, people listen to radio, they listen to audio dramas. If you can do all those things with no visuals, sure. Why can't you do something interactive, like a game with no visuals? So whether it's aimed at mainstream or blind, it's just that blind definitely has an advantage because they're used to listening to things. Uh, these types of games, I think there's room for them. And... Um, I just, I hope they do well and I hope that the medium matures more so that we do have games that are not only more detailed and more replayable, but that feel good to play. Like, you know, there are some games like on the PC where it's like, okay, just to do a basic thing, I need to memorize like 14 status controls and 12 movement buttons and like you know like i could what i could do with three you know two three buttons and an analog stick on a controller i need like 17 buttons and four hands to do on a computer because you have to have you know do all this information i mean there's a way to do it i mean even i i would be really interested to see in the next few years what audio game developers could do if they have played a game like The Last of Us, because this is a fully, not an open world, but like 3D world that you play just like a regular console game, but there's not a whole lot of extra crap bogging you down. Like all I got to do is click the stick, I point in the right direction, I swipe on the touchpad, I get my health and uh, character status. You know, there's not a lot of extra complexity for the sake of complexity. Um, you, like, for those things, you get things that are really complex. And then you get the gameplay that, you know, you run to the left and right and you kick or you shoot. You know, that's what it is. So... You know, I'm I'm very interested to see what's going to happen with Pitch Black, with The Veil, with some with some of these other audio games. Um, really want to see what's going to happen with some of those. Another one that I'm very intrigued about is Sable. They had that playable demo for like a month in May, I believe it was. I took a look at it on a stream, and I'm not into turn-based RPGs typically. Yeah, I've played the South Park games. I've played one or two other ones here and there. Not my jam. But I really think a, a large part of that could be just the amount of menuing and text reading that you have to do visually. All that small text, if I were able to hear that and just, you know, enjoy the game audibly, maybe I would be more into those games. If I Again, if I could more just comfortably, you know, kick back and wander around the world and you know, play the game and not have to keep straining my eyes for, you know, and these are longer games, so, you know, you're reading tons and tons for hours on end. Maybe I could see myself getting into more of this stuff. Uh, I played around with building a simple world. I actually emailed the developer back and forth quite a few times um, for about a month. We had a great conversation. I saved some of the emails because I'm definitely going to have to go back and look at them later. Um, I should have been one of the things when that demo was out, it gave me a lot of inspiration to think, you know, I can't code, but with this type of game engine here, maybe I could build my own game. 
I mean, yeah, it's, it's, you know, using other people's tools and I'd have to find other audio assets, you know, audio files and music and stuff, but that's fine. Um, but I tried developing a couple of possible story outlines for Sable where like if I could do the design work ahead of time when the full game comes out, then maybe I could just start plugging that into the game and try to build a world you know, build an actual RPG game and I could say, hey, I'm a game developer. I actually created and released a playable product for people. Um, the problem is I like to go grand and I really, especially being my first real game, I need to think of something really more simple, more streamlined and something that would work really well within that engine because that was a lot of what me and the developer talked about was like, okay, I have this idea for this type of quest. Can I do that with the tools that are available? Like if I put this marker here and I put this type of control here and I put this type of path or item here, can this happen? Can I have people give me multiple quests over time? All these things, like I said, I think of all these grand ideas and then you know, I, I get overwhelmed and I'm like, A, how would I even plug all this together in some sort of coherent fashion? And B, could I even make, could the game engine even support all this crazy stuff I'm trying to do? It's something that I really need to sit down and give some serious thought to. I've even heard of other people, you know, uh they're talking about things in more of a medieval type setting, but you don't, you know, you could use any sort of sound effect you wanted. You wouldn't even have to use like a fantasy thing. If you wanted, you could do just some sort of a, you know, you could do something in modern or sci-fi setting. You know, maybe you have magic in like a modern day, or maybe you have, tech skills instead of, you know, you, you kind of substitute tech spells in for, or like, or not text spells, but like tech, um, abilities like in cyberpunk or something for spells, you know, instead of calling them a spell, you call them like a tech ability or something. Um, so I, like I said, I just, I don't know. I need to come up with something that is at least for my first game, if I do end up making more, like I said, I, I'm not even going to go that far because I can't even make one yet. But I do really want to make a game. It could be a short game. It might be a simple game. But when Sable does come out, it is one thing that I do genuinely want to try. I genuinely want to... And I want to make an effort. Like, even if it's a small game, I don't want it to be just like, Oh, I pasted some text in, created a few things, slapped it together. Like I want it to be, I want it to be something that I'm proud of for my first game. Not just to say, Hey, look what I did. Um, I have high standards <laughs> that are hard to sometimes meet. So Sable, yes, I'm very interested in it. And I forget what their game that they're actually, you know, that's their engine but they're actually making an, uh, their own game out of it, which I can't remember the name of, but I'm interested to see how that plays. So maybe I'll have to play that one first, and that'll give me an idea of what the engine is capable and not capable of. Maybe it'll give me some ideas. So, you know, in the next year or so, that's something to look forward to, to play with, hopefully. Lost and Hound. This game is not out yet, but there is a playable demo of it, and I love what the game is going for. It is a mainstream game that is totally blind accessible and it's meant to be played where a sighted person and a blind person can play. There's no separate blindy mode. It's just, hey, you use audio to do certain game mechanics. I've been in contact with that developer too. Gave him some feedback on the demo and chatted about a few other things. That's all I'm going to say about that for now, but... Maybe there's some neat stuff happening with that in the future. So Lost and Hound, you know, check that demo out because that one has some promise. That one definitely has some potential. Um, 
I'm going to save The Last of Us Part 2 for the end of this because that's just that's sort of its own thing that I want to give more attention to. But with things like The Last of Us, Spider-Man Miles Morales, the Ubisoft games, Watch Dogs Legion, uh, not Far Cry, um, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, Immortals Phoenix Rising. A lot of these games have been adding a lot of accessibility features. These are mainstream games, and a lot of these are open world mainstream games. Okay, we don't have totally total blind accessibility yet. We can't really navigate the world efficiently or really navigate it well at all if we're totally blind. But they're getting there, you know, they're they're adding like all of the Ubisoft games have mostly, you know, there's there's some areas that still need some work, but a large part of their UI has text to speech. I can navigate the menus, I can read my inventory, my journal, my quests, my skill trees, my upgrades, my inventory. Maps need a little bit of work, and I really wish if you weren't using a PC, if you were using its controller, that sort of pointer, cursor, menuing, I just, I don't like that in a lot of cases. So hopefully they can kind of address that. Even, even I've seen other people like mainstream players like, you know, why do we have, you know, for a mouse that makes sense, but for a controller, there could be better ways to do that. Um... And then you have Watchdog Legion, and you know you have not just for blindness, but for other accessibility like subtitles, control customization. You have the auto drive for like Watchdog Legion. You can go to quests, um, and the car will just self drive. You have the glowing arrows on the road, which Cyberpunk doesn't have, and we'll talk about that later. Um, but no, we're seeing a lot, we're seeing a lot of accessibility features and improvements and just support, not only in indie games, but some of these AAA titles, you know, we've had the last of us for Sony. We have Ubisoft games. We have some EA stuff that's sort of happening now. I'm waiting for one of these new, I'm waiting for something like Halo Infinite to blow our mind. On Microsoft side, we've had uh, Minecraft Dungeons. Again, you can't really navigate the world, but they've done some really even neat things during gameplay, not just reading inventory and stuff, but like, oh, I killed a guy. Oh, and I'm, I ran over a uh, apple or a health item or some arrows. It telling you what you're, when I gain or lose health, how many arrows I have left if I shoot an arrow. So live things like that... Um, the Age of Empires. I haven't tried part three, but like if it's anything like part two, this remaster, God, the fact that if I'm low vision, I could actually attempt to play a real time strategy game with text to speech support. Yeah, that's really cool. So these types of things, um, there's been some great accessible games that have added you know, all these games that I've just mentioned, the three Ubisoft games, um, even Gears 5 or Gears Tactics have added some accessibility features. Spider-Man Miles Morales. I really want to play the PS5 version, not the PS4 version, because that has not only have, and they've also retrofitted these accessibility features into the remaster of the Spider-Man game that came out a couple years ago that I have not gotten into very far on my PS4. So I'm not even going to play that anymore. I'm going to wait until I get a PS5 and get the ultimate edition of Miles Morales, and then I'll have both games, and I can take advantage of these additional accessibility features because, heck yeah. Um, oh, it's just great to see these AAA games really starting to think about and try to implement accessibility. Are we perfect? No. We got a long way to go, and a lot of developers aren't even taking a look at it. Like I said, CD Projekt Red is just like pff, not only accessibility, but just general game conveniences and advances since The Witcher 3 came out. They really haven't 
moved forward much at all in the, in those areas. So I don't know. But um, more on that later. Minecraft Dungeons, I mentioned that. Age of Empires 2, probably 3. Spider-Man Miles Morales. PS5, finally getting able to confirm that it has a full screen reader, that it's not just the top level menus that actually talk. That is a huge win and makes me really want to, like if I could get a PS5, I would might consider just selling my PS4 because I can play The Last of Us and most of their games I own on the PS4, on the PS5. And then I would have a full screen reader. Yeah, I do kind of want a PS5 now. Sequence Storm has continuously been adding updates and modes and tracks and features and accessibility improvements. This guy is a one-man machine, you guys. Support this game if you haven't already. Sequence Storm on Steam for PC. Um, it is a really fun rhythm game. It's pretty hard. But again, like this one... And he had his own session at GAConf too. Watch that guy's session because, you know, I've talked to him as a developer a little bit here and there. Um, he dropped into one of Riley's streams earlier this year. That was really neat. Um... I don't know, that was last year that he dropped into our stream, I think. But no, I mean, I, I want to mention Sequence Storm because it, you know, it's still one of the really great indie examples. And it's, he didn't just release the game and there it is. He's still cranking away on it regularly. HyperDot got its full release this year. Um, very mobility friendly you're using one input you just move something around the screen um, all kinds of control methods it's got a high contrast mode it's got a dark mode um, covered it last year the early build covered it earlier this year the final game um, again another I think mostly one man couple person team um, really cool indie game that is a great example of accessibility Hades, another game that, God, if only it had text-to-speech, if only it had text-to-speech, that would be wonderful. But um, I know blind people, I know, like, I, I have got to go back and watch some of his videos for it, but like Brandon, he's been on the stream before, Brandon Cole, he's beaten that game full. He's gotten the, the he's, he's done the escape, He's gotten the full ending now. He's made enough runs to... He's completed enough runs where he's actually gotten the, the ending. He's totally blind. And he's gotten through the game. He's even gotten through those lava levels where I've been before. Um, so I gotta look into how he's doing it. Like if he's using text-to-speech or like OCR to scan for like the boons that you get. Or how he's doing that. But... You know, with some uh, with some work or with some, you know, a little bit of tinkering, um, blind people are playing that. And it is a really good game. If you want a good story-based action game, I love the story in it. It's one that I really need to go back and try to finish. Maybe I'll try to get to it over this break because I love what I've played so far. It's just a really solid game. Um couple mobile games here accessible one uh accessible 2048 i did a um access unlocked for the game threes a couple years ago and you know 2048 is kind of a spin-off of that somebody else made something similar well somebody made a fully voiceover accessible game of 2048 for ios and it works and it plays well and it is good so Definitely check that video and game out. That was a very nice surprise because, boy, I still play threes to this day. Played it actually earlier this morning. So, yeah. Um, a Western Drama. That is an audio game that came out that uh, I haven't finished yet. But um, I don't think I've released the video for it yet. But it will be coming soon if it hasn't been already. Uh, it is an audio game. It's kind of your... I would compare it to something similar along like a Blind Legend, something like that. You know, it's a story-based 
kind of a series of sequential events type of thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was a pretty neat title that came out fairly recently. Got a couple of other accessible games that I'm going to be covering on the channel, um, iOS and such. So those are some accessible games. Now let's get into more of the just other games that I've played this year. I haven't been able to cover Nintendo games because I just, you know, I can't record my Switch right now. But there were a lot of games here that were fun. No More Heroes 1 and 2, some of my favorite Wii games, came to the Switch. And I am very happy about that. And I even heard a rumor that it might be coming to the PC next year. And if it does, I'm so buying that because I'm so at least showing you guys the, the, the first game I really like. The second one I didn't like as much. But it had its own charm. But like, I play the hell out of No More Heroes 1. Action game, you're this crazy anime assassin guy that uh, has this beam katana, lightsaber-esque thing. And it's fun. It's weird. It's rad. It's just, it's fun. They're cool games. Um... Mario 3D All-Stars, that's your Mario 64, Sunshine, Galaxy, you know, they, they released that earlier this year. Um, I, I main thing that I learned is that I suck at these games now. My platforming skills have definitely atrophied over the years. And then we had, as a part of the 35th the year, uh, 35th anniversary for Mario, we had Mario... 35 Super Mario Brothers 35 which is a battle royale Mario Brothers game which is pretty cool. I really enjoyed that game and definitely need to play it more because it starts out maybe a little bit slow but boy by the end it is a frantic chaotic free for all mess. It is it is insane. Um and in a good way. It is fun. You're, you're, every time you defeat an enemy, you're you're shooting it over to someone else's. So if I kill a Goomba, it goes to somebody else. If I kill Bowser, if I kill a Lakitu or anything like that, um, they just start randomly appearing on other people's screens or, you know, kind of like how you did with Tetris 99. And you could be going through a level. You could be going through 1-1 and start seeing Bowsers and Bullet Bills and all kinds of shenanigans. So, yeah, it gets pretty crazy. And it's fun. I didn't play it, but I know Animal Crossing was a big thing this year. I have just never got into the Animal Crossing games, and I think, again, a large part of it is you have the gibberish audio for the character dialogue, and you have the text. If it were, even if it were done like Mitomo, where they did like a weird robotic voice, and it spoke the actual words, I might be more, imp I might be more patient with it. And I might want to play it a little bit more, but there's so many other things that I've wanted to do. I tried the GameCube version, and since then, I just, I never, I never could really get into it all that much. If I'm going to play sort of a game like that, I'll do Stardew Valley or Harvest Moon, something like that. I know it's not the same, but it's at least kind of a similar, relaxing style game. So Animal, Cro Animal Crossing did help a lot of people this year came out at the perfect time mario kart ios this was uh god did that come out earlier this year or was it late last year i don't even remember when it came out uh but i mentioned that because i did play it a fair amount it's just one of those games that i can mindlessly play on my ipad while i'm listening to an audiobook or podcast or something you know it's not your traditional mario kart it's got your stupid free-to-play unlock microtransaction crap. Like, yo, you got to get enough crystals or luck out and unlock a character crap in it. But for what it is, you know, I just, I play it. There's, you know, regular events and challenge or like, you know, tracks and stuff. So, you know, I'll, I'll play it here and there. And then we have Mario Kart Live Home Circuit. I haven't done a video for it yet, but I'm at least going to try to show you. I probably won't be able to set up a track just because I don't have a whole lot of space in my apartment. But I wanted that as a, even as a Nintendo collectible, and I love Mario Kart. And the fact that I can control a remote control Mario Kart car 
with my Nintendo Switch was just something that I I had I had to be a part of. So I did finally find a copy of that. I did pick it up. And yes, I have driven my Mario Kart around my apartment with its camera on it. And it's pretty rad. Not going to lie. It's pretty sweet. Um, would it be better if I had more space? Absolutely. But you know what? I had to have it. It was cool. Nintendo also had their Game & Watch Super Mario Brothers. I have done a video for that, and that'll be coming out here probably early next year. So look forward to that. It's just a little Game & Watch uh, with the Super Mario Brothers and Lost Levels games on there. That came out. Um, a lot of classic shooters have been and are coming to Nintendo Switch. So like, if you want a handheld handheld console that can play games like Doom and Doom 64, Duke Nukem, Dusk, a lot of these types of games, man, you can play them on your Switch. And that's pretty cool, especially now that I've got my bigger uh, controllers and I don't have to play with the tiny Joy-Cons anymore. Uh, I'd watch that video if you haven't already. I finally found some controllers that are comfortable in handheld mode. And Super Mario 35, I talked about that. So non-Nintendo stuff. Other things, most of these I've covered on the channel. A couple of them I haven't. But um, Roomba earlier this year, where you play the sentient Roomba vacuum cleaner who gets to defend your house against criminals. That was fun. That was oddly really kind of addictive. It was like Home Alone the isometric video game you you set traps you trigger appliances you kill the intruders you turn them into sausages and then clean them up before the and clean up all the blood try to before the uh homeowners come home it's really dumb but in the best possible way love it rico i know that came out the year before but i played it a lot this year again it's one of those just sort of dumb comfort games when I was going through stuff earlier this year that I played and, you know, I would listen to stuff while I played it, but it was just kind of one of those really, again, dumb comfort games that drew just really kind of helped me. House Flipper was another one that, uh, I think, I don't know if it came out this year. It might've been last year. I think it was, but it was, I have to mention it because I did fully beat it. I did play through it all. And again, it was one of those, again, just kind of mindless comfort foods that I was going through after everything that happened this spring. Um, it helped a lot, and it's just fun. And I know they're coming out with more. They're coming out with some sort of luxury expansion next year, which I'm looking forward to. There's apparently a castle flipper, like a medieval version of that game, which I'm sort of curious to see what that's going to be. And I think they're even doing something else. So they're doing a lot of different little spins on that, which, you know what? If they're all fun and they can all, like I said, they're, they're great podcast games because I can just putz around in the game and listen to a book or a podcast. They, I did a lot of that this summer. So House Flipper, had to mention that. Minecraft Dungeons, I mentioned that in the accessibility section, but I was really hooked on that for about a month. And I know they've added extra content since then, and I really need to check that out. But yeah, Minecraft Dungeons is pretty darn good, because I played the heck out of that earlier this year, need to come back to it. Had some really nice text-to-speech accessibility in it, could use a few little tweaks here and there, some few things that don't speak or that could be spoken differently, but very much appreciative. And the game itself is fun, too. You know, it's kind of an isometric my first uh, Diablo style action RPG and I'm digging it. I beat the main campaign and then I tried to go do it again. Uh, but then I, or I tried to replay levels only to find out that, Oh, once you beat it, they really ramp up the difficulty and you probably should start from the beginning again. Otherwise you're just going to get massacred. So yeah, Minecraft dungeons. Doom eternal. I talked a little bit about this in the uh, first video, but this was a game that I was really looking forward to. Both Riley and I were looking forward to. And gameplay-wise, overall, it in a lot of ways, it's fantastic. In a lot of ways, it's really good. 
when you get into an arena, when you get into just a big old area with a bunch of enemies and you got a good weapon loadout, it's fun. You, know, you got the music cranking. Everything just, yeah, it's a, it's a blast. <clears throat> um, but there were sections in Doom 2016 where you had to do some platforming and stuff like that, and I didn't like those sections as much. And they really doubled down on that in Doom Eternal. Uh, there were places where I just didn't see the thing that I was supposed to do. Like, oh, I had to go around the corner and there was a thing that I had to jump and cling on to. Or there was a ledge that I missed or a pole that I had to swing off of or some weird thing that I didn't see. Even there was a couple things where they're way off in the distance. I had to shoot something to trigger some sort of thing that I could then jump to. Um, so there were some navigational issues, even from a low vision point of view that I had trouble with. And later in the game, I know people have figured out ways around them or to beat them better, but those marauders, man, they have still given me a lot of trouble from when I last played and they are a pain and I don't really like fighting them. And apparently the expansion has a boatload more of them amongst other things so hmm, yeah i don't know about that i'm gonna have to really learn how to fight those but you know so gameplay wise itself some of the navigational issues that i had some of the platforming issues that i had i just didn't like it quite as much the shooting the gameplay the music the presentation it ran great on my machine but just some of these issues i just didn't take to it as much as I hoped, which was a big disappointment. And then, you know, like I said, this being something that my ex and I were just really both looking forward to, and then getting dumped around the same time just really did not do that game any favors. So I just kind of have some bad vibes with that game, um, just some disappointment with it for that. But, you know, so it, it's, it's some of that. But a large part of it is some of the gameplay changes that they that they tweaked from Doom 2016, where unfortunately it just I didn't it didn't click with me like Doom 2016 did. I didn't. I thought this was going to be like my game of the year, and it totally not only was it not my game of the year, but I kind of forgot about it. Like it really wasn't that big of a. I played it for a couple of weeks. And then I just kind of left it alone, which is sad. But maybe eventually I'll be able to go back to it. Maybe one day I'll fire it up again when I, on my new PC or something. But for now, it is what it is. And um, we also had Doom 64, a cool remake of that coming out, a remaster of that. And that plays really well. Um, I played a bit of that this year, and it plays good. Um, it's on it's on the switch it's on consoles it's on pc i pre-ordered doom eternal so i got it and it is good so i did enjoy that half-life alex this is one that i was really looking forward to i don't really dare play it on my current rig because i'm not sure that this is that vr game <sighs> i think my system is right on the verge like i might be able to play it but some of my fans are kind of blowing a little bit harder for some games as it is. I really don't want to tempt fate and blow up my system like I did when I played the Fear demo back in the day. Um, so I'm just going to hold off on that one. I've seen some footage of it, you know, not a lot. But um, when I get my new PC and I have a 3080 in there, definitely going to give that one a look. I'm going to try to do some sort of video for it, a spotlight video for that on the channel. But it is a noteworthy game. The people who played it love it. It's a great immersive VR experience. It's Valve, so I definitely want to check that out. Moving Out was a fun little game I played for a little while. It had some nice accessibility features in it. And it had, you know, just some, like when you had to pick up furniture and everything, the, they glowed, there were control, there were difficulty, there were time accessibility options. It's this isometric game where you're moving people out of their house. They're packing certain things into a truck so they can move. But, you know, it's this arcadey, crazy, like, you're a mover, and yeah, you're moving things, but 
I'm, you know, we're not going to guarantee that it's going to get there in one piece. We're going to throw it downstairs. We're going to throw it out windows. We're going to bang it on everything. It gets to be a pretty crazy but fun game. Enjoyed that. Um, Man Eater, yeah. Man Eater was one that I was. I like this game. I played this one quite a bit this summer. You're a shark. You're essentially Jaws. You get to fight fish and eat them, alligators and eat them, and you get to prey on man. Yes, it's man eater. You get to jump out of the water, wreck boats, knock people out of their boat, chow down on them. You get bounty hunters after you. It plays out like a redneck reality TV show. It's really dumb. It's really great. You fight these alpha predators and you get different like at, like different upgrades to your shark. Like I can electrocute people now because I have like electric body parts. It's great. It gets kind of hard and I haven't beat it yet, but I need to get back to it cuz it is dumb fun and I love what I played with it. I'm glad that game turned out as well as it did because Maneater was fun. I think I have a spotlight video out for it, but I do have a stream archive, I think, that I haven't released for you guys yet, so enjoy more Maneater content soonish. That game is really fun. Serious Sam 4. Yeah, I played through that, and largely it was really fun. Uh, I believe I have a stream out there for you guys already. I do have a spotlight video recorded, but I haven't released it yet. I'm going to, you know, again, I'm spacing these out, letting you guys... Uh, you know, I'll give it to you. Probably it'll come out early next year. And toward the end of the game, there were just, yeah, it prom it. I wish it did it earlier in the game, but like toward the end of the game, there are literally thousands of enemies. It is bananas. As cool as the mech sequences were, there were some parts about that visually that I found really frustra frustrating and difficult. I'm glad I was able to get through them. There were a few vehicle sections. There was one part where I was driving a combine in a field. And yes, just running people, running zombies over with a combine. It was pretty great. Um, but yeah, Serious Sam 4. You've seen me play all the other Serious Sam games on the channel. So you kind of know what to expect there. Spin Rhythm XD. Here we get one of those rhythm games that I don't know about playing anymore because of all the copyright crap going on now. But it is a unique take on a rhythm game. You know, it's kind of like you're going down this tunnel, this tube, and you got your notes coming at you like most, but you spin the tube to match the colors, the beam, like the beam on the bottom, you kind of match it to the colors, and then you hit the, you know, you hit the A button for the percussion beats. And even with just those two mechanics, it gets really fast and really challenging. And it got a really weird techno song stuck in my head for like a month off and on. Um, it sounds like a weird chipmunk techno thing. And I don't know what the hell they're saying most of the time, but it's weird. I believe the song is Colorblind by Panda Eyes, I think, if I remember correctly. Look that up on YouTube. It's really weird. But yeah, that one, it's nonsense, but it got stuck in my head. Fun game, though, and it's definitely one that I will probably come back to off and on. Uh, Hades, I mentioned that during the accessibility section. That was a really fun one. I really need to get back and beat. Super Hot, Mind Control Delete. Yes, they made a kind of a new game for Super Hot, and they structured it a little bit differently, but it plays quite similarly to the old one, the the one that I played a couple of years ago. It is fun, it is good, it's basically badass Matrix the game, and it's pretty great, pretty fun. Post Void is a really tough but kind of addictive little first person shooter where the countdown timer is you only have seconds to stay alive and killing an enemy adds like a couple seconds to your time. And it's like one hit, one kill. And it's just, it's frantic. The, the graphics are really bizarre and pulp, like pixely and trippy. 
it's weird, it's fun, it's really difficult, but I kind of dug it, and uh, I've been playing that off and on. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2 Remastered. They did it. They actually made another good Tony Hawk game. Hallelujah. After their last couple outings, I was not feeling the Tony Hawk series for a while. I'm like, oh God, especially after that nameless Tony Hawk 5 that was just hot garbage. Um, I'm so glad to see that came back, and I hope to God next year that they announce a Tony Hawk 3 add-on to that <clears throat> with those levels. Because I have so much fond memories playing that game in the dorms. This is one that I'm definitely going to keep coming back to. I want to play more user-created content. Hopefully I'll be able to play some multiplayer and get some graffiti going. That'll be fun. Fall Guys. Little multiplayer, obstacle course, battle royale, double dare kind of a game. Where you play these little jelly bean dudes. Everything is bright colors. I got hooked on that for a little while. And Season 3, where they have added new content to it, just came out. Never played Season 2. Never got around to it, but I played season one quite a bit. Um, you know, again, it's you know, it's kind of your battle royale, but it's non-violent. It's just a bunch of crazy little costumed jelly bean dudes that are jumping and flying all over the place. Quite fun, and it was a really big hit this year for a lot of people. Battle Toads, yeah, they brought that game back. And I've done a spotlight for it. I can't remember if I streamed it at all. I might have done that a little bit, but I think I have a spotlight video coming out here pretty soon for it. They brought it back. It is a 2D brawler. It is hard. There are platforming sections. There are some other, you know, the, the always thing that they did with like the turbo tunnel and some of these platforming and other weird sections. It is really, really hard in some areas. I like the presentation of it, the cartoony style. I could see like an animated cartoon of it and just being able to watch that because the characters are just really dumb and goofy. Um, fun little surprise. So, yeah, Battletoads. Kill it with fire. That was a little distraction I had earlier this year that was pretty fun. Yeah, go around the house, kill spiders and other little bug creatures with uh, things like a frying pan, a flamethrower, uh, like, or like a hairspray flamethrower. Um, I don't even remember what I, all kinds of different weapons to just, that were completely overkill. But we're going to blast these suckers off the face of the earth. And it was fun. I rather enjoyed that game. Hellbound, kind of a Doom style first person shooter. Didn't care for it when I first started, but after I got a level or two in and kind of got the feel of the game a little bit better, it started growing on me, and um, yeah, it's pretty fun. It's kind of like a, kind of like a Doom 1 style game, but maybe more like a Doom 3. I don't know how to describe the graphics, but I mean, it's not overly dark. It's not at all, but... Um, yeah, it is kind of a Doom-style Doom, Doom style game. Um, that video will be coming out here soon again, pretty soon. Breakpoint. Really fun arcade game that was a surprise. It's like a dual analog stick shooter, kind of like a Geometry Wars. But instead of shooting, it's melee-based. You get little... Everything is a little like, like vector graphics. It's glowy. It's like neon. You're this little shape, and you get... Um, you get swords and axes and spears and you have all these particles that are honing in on you and it's just really fun. I, yeah, I genuinely enjoyed that one. That was a really good one. And, uh, I did a stream of it. I can't remember if that stream is out. I think it might be cause I played it along with another, I think I played that one with Elderborn, which I'll mention here. Oh, shortly. Um, Got my Elite controller, Xbox Elite 2 controller. I finally, I got a good deal and uh, circumstances where I was able to get that controller. And you know what? Uh, it's an expensive, like $150, $60 controller. But having played with it for a few months now, I really, you know, there's nothing wrong with the original controller. But 
uh, just I really love the way this one feels, and it has definitely become my primary controller, so it's been really fun. Elderborn. Um, this is a game, like a first-person uh, melee-based game. You're fighting with swords and other weapons like that. You're fighting skeletons and creatures and all kinds of stuff, and it's really kind of tough. Um, but I did a stream on that earlier, and that was the one I think where I, I finished, or I pl played that game for a while, needed a little break, and so I switched over to Breakpoint. So I, I believe that stream might be out, but I can't remember. If not, it will be in the next short while. Um, Super Liminal. This is a really cool first person puzzle game. You know, think of something like Portal, but you're playing with like perspective. And the way, like, things, how big and small things are in reality, and, like, just really cool stuff. I have a spotlight video recorded for it, and I have an actual, it's a short game. I did also record a Let's Play, so that is going to come out next year eventually, too. So, again, I record a lot of videos in advance, so if I get sick or if I'm away, I can keep the content coming. There's a lot of stuff coming out already, but, yeah, um... Super Liminal, I really enjoyed that when I got to play it. I talked about the Ubisoft games up in the accessibility section, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, Watch Dogs Legion, Immortals Phoenix, Phoenix Rising, all different takes on the open world game, but I'm glad they ex added a lot of the text-to-speech and other accessibility features. That being said, I am getting kind of burned out with open world games. I'm kind of looking for more smaller shorter maybe more linear or focused games because boy they're just oh everything is going open world which in some ways is like some games are really fun but you know you get some of the same types of objectives and you're climbing towers and you're fetching this thing and you're unlocking that thing and it's just like eh i don't know a little bit of open world fatigue there um AVGN, The Angry Video Game Nerd, Volume 1 and 2 Remastered. I've got a spotlight video for that coming out. Um, they added some difficulty modes, which were much needed, because I did a video for the original game a couple of years ago, and that game was really tough. So I checked that out. They have multiple difficulty settings. There are still some low vision issues with that game. But if you like old-school, hard 8-bit platformers, fun little game you might want to look into. Double Kick Heroes, I mentioned this in another video where we talked about the copyright stuff. Kind of a 2D rhythm game where you're uh, outrunning this horde of zombies after some apocalypse. You're this like metal band and you're the percussionist. You're playing the drums and trying to do every time you hit a drum, you shoot dudes and you shoot zombies and vehicles and rabid dogs and all kinds of other crazy stuff, but it's fun. 13, really cool game back in the day, got remastered. I ha I'm going to release this video soon. Unfortunately, I would not recommend it in its current state. They totally changed the art style. The control just doesn't feel really good. There are some antiquated like gameplay mechanics and bad checkpointing and just things in this game that... I was really hoping that they would put some more effort and fix and modernize some of those things, but, you know, keep the spirit of it, but, like, take away some of the insta-fail frustration of that game. And they really didn't. So, huge bummer. Maybe they'll fix some of it. I, I know that pe a lot of people were pissed about it. And I know this, the developer said that they're working on some stuff to try to make it a little bit better. But, again, this was one that maybe was either rushed or they put it out too soon or they just, again, a kind of a minimal effort and then people called them on it. Kind of disappointing because I was really looking forward to liking that and showing it to you guys. Bug Snacks. Bunger? <laughs> oh my God, Bug Snacks. Came to PC. Yeah. Um, first person adventure puzzle game you have these little food critters that are all puns bunger of course is this hamburger 
bug, you know, their combination bugs and snacks. They've got like burgers and fries and ribs and fruits, fruits, um, strawberries and it's just goofy fun. And I love the way that the little critters, <laughs> they just always say their name, but they have such personality to them that I can't help but laugh. Like I said, Bunger is just the, every time I hear it, I laugh. It's just funny. You know, like Strawby, they're like all panicky. They're like, Strawby, Strawby. And it's just really funny. Fun little game. I really need to finish that at some point here too. Tetris Effect Connected. Got that on the Xbox Game Pass. It's Tetris Effect and it has multiplayer in it. And it's kind of a new... Uh, I don't want to say Zen, but like really kind of artistic take on the Tetris, uh, games. I do have a stream up for that right now. I don't think I've recorded a spotlight video for it, but I will likely do that at some point in the future. BPM bullets per minute. This is one that I really was looking forward to, but I just can't get into it. I'm just terrible at it. It is a rhythm-based first-person shooter where you have to shoot and reload on the beat. And a lot of problems with it are like, you know, there's a lot of like these little smaller enemies that are flying around or on the ground. Um, I don't know. There's just something with it that is not clicking with me. And I'm like I said, I'm absolutely terrible at it. Um... I've given it several chances. I've tried it a few times and for whatever reason, I just, I can't, I love it in theory and some of the music is catchy. I'm just terrible at it. And like I said, some of the creatures are small. They kind of, everything's kind of brown and red and just sort of blends in sometimes. And I don't know. Um, wanted to really like it. And I do in theory, but I'm just terrible at it. There's a game coming out next year that I'll talk about in the next video. That is, again, there was two games that were announced that were sort of rhythm first person shooters. And I really hope that one, that one almost looks like a step up as far as like polish and variety and features. I really want that to be good, but we're going to talk about that one tomorrow. Um, Guns Blazing, kind of a little classic retro style first person shooter um i got a video for that coming out here pretty soon um that's just a really fun one that i've been addicted to the last uh off and on the last couple of weeks genshin or yeah genshin impact free to play zelda breath of the wild-esque at least in presentation anyway it's kind of one of these open world gotcha rpgs there's some free to play and microtransaction mechanics that I really don't like where I don't know if I'm going to really play it much more, but you know, it's available on PC and console and even iOS. So like I could play this on my iPad and I could, the, the saves will cross over. So, um, I recorded a video for it. I don't, yeah, I did release the video for that. So there is a video for Genshin impact. If you want to check that out, um, I mean, the gameplay itself is actually pretty decent. You know, it's a little bit more stream. It's a little bit more, I don't want to say basic, but, you know, it's different enough from Zelda. But it has those sort of things. It's got your RPG mechanics. But to unlock characters and items and crafting, and there are a lot of my, a lot of different currencies in the game and stuff that there's so many other things that I want to be able to do that I just don't see myself dedicating the time sink that it would take to really put into that game to make it worth it. So yeah, cyberpunk 2077. I'm going to try to keep it brief here, but this is a game that boy, like I was really looking forward to it. Kind of a futuristic cyberpunk fallout four esque type of game, maybe part Grand Theft Auto, RPG, Fallout, you know, whatever mixture you want to come, you know, whatever you, whatever combination you want to imagine. 
core mission and game design wise, there's fun there. I've played through the prologue up to, you know, past the, um, the, the title card, which is actually a few hours in, believe it or not. Um, PC is the least buggy of them all. Probably. I mean, it runs the best out of all of the versions. If you own a PS4 or Xbox, um, Xbox one, I don't know that I would bother right now because even Sony delisted it from their store. It's so buggy and bad and performance. Um, PS5, Xbox series consoles probably have a little bit better chance. Um, but they're not quite as good as the PC. You know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time because I really dove into it with the first video this week where we talked about all the bad things and unfinished games. I mean, this is just going to be the poster child for that. For a while going forward, you know, CD Projekt Red really burned some bridges. I think, you know, people were really lo loving Witcher 3. They had pr CD Projekt was making, you know, they do good old games or GOG. They were really, they were touting themselves as so much pro-consumer. And like I said in the stream and everything the other day, I feel bad for the actual developers, the people that are working these like crunch shifts and just like, it's just ridiculous to try to salvage what they can of this game and get out what they can. It's the management of CD project that some people just need to resign or be fired because I mean, they're treating their employees terribly overworking them crunch they're bowing down to their shareholders and like oh we got to read we got to make it out for q4 they you know specifically didn't let people know that you know reviewers couldn't play the older gen console versions they wouldn't even let reviewers use their own recorded footage even if they played on pc they had to use their um, they had to use the devel or the developer publisher's own footage for their initial reviews. And something right there should tell you, boy, that's a little sketchy. You know, and that's why these things were like people get games early. And if they release the review early, you really don't even have to look at the score because you know it's going to be reviewed high. You get developers that hide versions of their game or won't let you talk about certain things or they hold re review copies for after the game launch so that they can't get and play the game. Their reviews will come out days after release so that the people who want it will buy it anyway. You know, it's things like this that that's another thing that's really got to change. You know, a bad game should be able to be reviewed early too because, hey, I want to know if a game sucks just as bad as I want to know if it's good. You know, but if you're able to release a review a week early... Uh, or or more, duh, it's going to get a high rating because, of course, that's part of the hype cycle. And I really wish reviewers didn't have to bow down. And like I said, uh, reviews at this point, and even coverage, you get these Twitch streamers, these YouTubers um, that get things early and they stream things early. It's not a review. It is just, hey, I got this free game, so I'm gonna, you know, kiss the developer's ass and, you know, say that it's a, that it's a good game and look at how cool I am. I got it early and I can play it for you. Um, I don't like that. You know, I want to know. A review is supposed to tell me what is good and bad and whether I should buy it or not. I really like ACG's reviews. Because he, he, they're really, they're, they're different. They're, you know, they, he has kind of this buy, wait for sale, rent, never touch system. His reviews are just really entertaining the way he describes certain things. Um, they're just really entertaining. Um, so there's a few of them out there. But yeah, Cyberpunk, there's things I like about it. Um, I have not done a spotlight video I did the initial accessibility video. I did a stream of it, which I believe I released. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. Because it was part of the one with Super Mario World, the theme park thing. And then we went into 
the Zelda thing and cyberpunk. Yeah. So I have a couple videos that show it. Um, I probably will do a video, a spotlight video specifically for cyberpunk, but I want to wait until, you know, CD project red has al already said that there's major patches coming January, February. I'm going to probably wait till I get a new PC and I can run this thing proper. Um, Maybe they'll add some accessibility. Maybe there'll be a mod that'll add in-world navigation. God, one can hope. Um, I don't know. Uh, the coverage is up in the air for this one. Finally, we're going to wrap up this video by talking about The Last of Us Part 2. It's the only thing that I can end this video on because <clears throat> I love the original Last of Us. That was one of the major reasons I bought a PS4. It looked so cool. Some of their E3 demos and stuff. Played it. Loved it. So I was going to play The Last of Us 2 anyway. Well then, what, a month before it came out, Naughty Dog dumped all of this accessibility news on us and we're like, holy crap, no way. Plus, 60 plus accessibility features in this game. Theoretically, a totally blind person is going to be able to play this start to finish. There's full text-to-speech support. There's in-world, like, pathfinding navigation assistance. There's... I, I can't even go through all the accessibility features. We'd be here all night. Um, there's so much to that game. And, like I said, I was going to play it anyway. I bought it. It came out on, what did it come out on, like a Friday? Yeah, like a Thursday or Friday. I think it was like a Thursday. Yeah, I think it was. Um, but whatever, you know, this is a 25, 35 hour game. Um, I streamed the first couple hours of me playing it. That is out there already. You can check that out. I go through some of the accessibility features. And then I play through one of the <clears throat> major events early on in the game. And, you know, again, just having the text-to-speech for the notes that you find in the environment, your inventory, your quests, your tutorials, your instructions. There's not just text-to-speech, but audio cues for, oh, you need to block, you need to jump, you need to um, other different actions. You had a pinging system for enemies and objects in the in the world you had a high contrast like a predator vision i call it where like the environment would become gray and blue and you had enemies in red allies in blue there were some sections of the game where this was extremely helpful because of the high detail graphics where I, it was tough to kind of see where somebody was hiding so I could just switch that on and off at will. There was an in-game magnifier that actually worked very well during gameplay. I didn't really have to use it really much, but it was there if I did. But the, and then you could, like I said, you could click the net, the, I think it was the left analog stick and it would point you to your primary objective. If you had were pinging an object, then you could um, navigate directly to it. I mean, these are all features that I used as a low vision gamer. You know, somewhere meant, you know, like I said, you can use them if you're totally blind, if you're low vision, you just want some convenience or anything in between. I mean, the story itself was captivating for me. I enjoyed that a lot. I enjoyed the core gameplay mechanics, the, the shooting, the stealth, the exploration. Um, you know, it was what I expected out of a Last of Us game. But then on top of that, due to how easy it was to play this game with accessibility features, like I said, it was a 25, 35 hour game. I started it mid, like, it was, it was like Friday morning. Yeah, because I had taken that Friday off. That's what it was. It came out like Thursday night, and then I, I started playing it like on a Friday morning. And I don't remember if it was Saturday or Sunday night. But it was by the end of the weekend, in two, three days tops, 
I mean, I, I ate a few, I ate a couple times. I got up and stretched a couple times, went to the bathroom here every now and again. I slept a little bit at night, but I was just so enthralled with this game and I have not been sucked into a game for so long like this. I started that game mid Friday morning by the end of the weekend. That game was done. I finished the story. Like I just every consume every waking hour was just consumed with that game um, because I was just so enthralled with it, with the accessibility, the story. I wanted to see what would happen. The game itself was just fun. I loved exploring the beautiful environments. This is the triple A gold standard in accessibility right now. I mean, I know all games are different. All, you know, there's different accessibility features that are needed for different game types of games and mechanics, but this just shows you what can be done. Like I said, even in other videos that I've made, like the Left 4 Dead videos, I'm like, there's a lot you can do for accessibility, but I couldn't wrap my head around how do you make navigating a huge 3D open world or 3D world you know, where you're climbing over trucks and vehicles and ledges and, you know, it's not just a flat plane like you're in all the audio games. How do you navigate it without being tedious and you're bumping into the wall constantly or you're just, you're completely lost or any number of things? And not only did The Last of Us 2 do it, it did it well. It did a hell of a job. I beat it. I know of at least two to three, maybe more, totally blind people who have done it. People have done it on stream, on video. I mean, this is huge. You know, you get, like I said, you got these open world games for Ubisoft and Microsoft and everything. They're not quite there with the navigation stuff, but in the next couple of years, we're going to see... We're going to see an actual open world game fully playable by blind players. It's going to happen. I, did, I thought it might, but I thought it would take a lot longer than it would than it will. But I would hazard a guess to say in the next two to three years, we're going to see like an, an Assassin's Creed or something really open like that that is going to be playable by the blind. Because Last of Us 2 proved that you can navigate an open world like that. And it was pretty incredible. So that is where we're going to end it. I told you guys really this week that this is going to be the long video because we have a lot of games to cover, but there you go. That is the games, some highlights of 2020. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Like it. If you did, you can follow me on Twitter at BGFH 79 twitch.com slash illegally cited illegally cited.com and right here on youtube we'll wrap it up here and we'll see you guys tomorrow for the final video of 2020 chat with you guys later happy holidays